birthday. Okay, all right. So um, first and foremost, there's some information that you're absolutely gonna have to commit to memory. In fact, both sides of this sheet um, are very much a part of that midterm exam that you guys will have to take. And yeah, it's October, so we're kind of starting to talk about like the midterm because I don't give small tests. I give like one big test. I'll give you a study guide so you don't need to panic or anything. But um, you may just want to make a note, don't lose this. And for my kiddos at home, y'all, this is the colonial lit background sheet. And then on the back, I put the poetry terms, which y'all have up through Canvas, okay? All right, so um, some things that you're flat gonna have to know. Pilgrims, Puritans, Separatists. What's the difference between all of these things? Are any of y'all in A push, by the way? Any of you guys in? Okay, just a couple of y'all. So some of y'all already talked about this, but for the rest of you guys, this may be new information. So, William Bradford is the one who called his people pilgrims. He referred to them as pilgrims in his journal of Plymouth Plantation, which is what you read the excerpt out of, right? But before you even go further, you need to know what a pilgrim is. So, think about it. What's a pilgrimage? You've heard that term before. You may have heard it said something like, um, they're going to take a pilgrimage to Mecca like or to Jerusalem. Well, it is, it's like a, um, a journey, but it's taken for a very specific purpose. If you're gonna take a pilgrimage to a holy city, why do you think that journey takes place? Yeah, it's a, it's a religious journey. Yeah, it, I mean, write that down, guys. A pilgrimage is a religious journey. Great vocabulary word, by the way. A pilgrimage is a religious journey. Okay, therefore, a pilgrim is what? One who would... Help me out here. Yeah, take a religious journey, right? So the pilgrims, we all know, and you've learned this since you were like little bitty, they all came over on the Mayflower so that they could have religious freedom, right? Now what you may not have realized is, and I didn't until I was an adult, I thought they came straight from England, but that's not the case. They actually went to Holland and were there for like 12 years before they actually did come over to the New World. And the reason they came over from Holland is because their um, children, you know, they've been there 12 years, and so they have a lot of children that are born in Holland, and they see them starting to assimilate into the Dutch culture, and it makes them nervous. They're like, we're getting a little too comfortable over here. We need to go where we can have complete religious freedom without any kind of distractions. And so that's why they chose to come over, and they settled what would, of course, be um, the Plymouth Colony, right? Now, pilgrims, religious journey, that, uh, sorry, that is not what they called themselves at the time. I always thought this was interesting. What did they call themselves? Saints. Saints. Yeah, so, I mean, very clearly we see this idea that they perceive themselves to be God's people. We are the saints, right? And the others called them something a little bit different, and the, you hear this from a lot. The others called them separatists, and you absolutely have to know the reason for this. So these folks are separatists because what, Alonzo? They separated from the Church of England. Good, they completely separated from the Church of England. Now, if you didn't have that underlined or highlighted, do that now, because that's one of those key ideas that you're gonna need not only in this class, but eventually in your history class as well. So there's a big difference between the pilgrims that come over in 1620, they're called separatists, and then the Puritans who are gonna come over in 1630, okay? The Puritans that come over, they are in general more strict, less tolerant. Um, you know, the pilgrims give us the account of the first Thanksgiving right? So we know that they were able, by and large, to like get along with the Native Americans. Well, the Puritans come over and 
They are not nearly as open or tolerant as people with differences. And so they seem to get kind of this harsher, stricter, you know, reputation than the earlier pilgrims. So the Puritans are called Puritans for what reason? It's on here. Good, they purify the church from within. So you gotta mark that as well. So the pilgrims or separatists completely break away from the church. The Puritans stay within the church, but work to purify the church of what they feared were like all of the distractions and like the ornate qualities of the Catholic church that they still thought were kind of lingering in that Church of England. So if any of you guys are Catholic, I don't mean to you know offend anyone, but they thought that all the beauty and ornate structures like the cathedrals, they saw all that stuff as like a distraction. So you wanted a direct relationship with God. You didn't want any kind of you know obstacles or distractions. They very much valued like a, a simple worship service, a strict moral code, and it all kind of falls down to a couple of key beliefs that um, they had, okay? All right, now you guys are gonna want to mark all the stuff that's under both pil Pilgrims and Puritan sock, okay? So highlight, they wanted a direct relationship with God. In other words, there's no like priest, okay? They wanted to um, be sincere and moral. They wanted radical, simple services. And then this one, if you can highlight it and put a big star next to it, and maybe even circle it, because this one's key, they looked for God's will in every event, okay? So for instance, in the crucible, remember they very much believed that the devil was walking among them, okay? That, you know, Mary Warren, when she said he got me, he came to me to sign, to sign my name in his book. They were like, wait, the devil's book? I mean, they very much believed that the devil could walk, walk among them. But the flip side of that is they also very much believed that God could walk among them, right? Or work among them. So if, um, let's see, Kaylee, has good fortune, if her crops on her farm survive and she is able to bear and raise all of her children, then Kaylee has you know, clearly done something that God approves, right? God sees goodness in her and is rewarding her. Whereas Megan, right? Megan, her farm fails, you know, her livestock that she's trying to raise, got, you know, get sick and die off. And they would see that as symbolic that Megan has done something that's displeased God. Okay? That's going to be important because when we get to this passage or when we get to Of Plymouth Plantation, which you guys read, it's been a while. You read it last Friday. How many times did William Bradford mention God? I mean, I don't have a number. It was a lot, though, wasn't it? So every time something good happened, he said it was God's plan, right? Don't know that he has any passages in this that talk about bad things. Ha oh, you know what? He does talk about how the sailors that were not a part of their group grew sick and how they were reluctant to take care of each other. And he kind of, you know, makes it sound like that's because they were not godly people, right? I mean, the pilgrims, when they fell sick, they took care of each other like a family and even cared for some of the sailors. And that was a God thing. So he gives the credit to God for this. Let me read you a passage. This is probably my favorite passage in the whole thing. And let me see if I can find it. All right. Now, y'all just have to listen because you don't have it in front of you, okay? He says, on the way over... Brayden, are you really that fascinated with the pen? Are you listening? Yes. What did I just say? I wasn't listening. Okay, there you go. All right, so on the way over, he says, a lusty young man, lusty does not mean this man was like, you know, lusting after someone, just means he was healthy. A lusty young man called John Hallen 
coming upon some occasion above the gratings was with the seal of the ship thrown into the sea. So this young man on the way over falls overboard, right? But it pleased God that he caught hold of the top cell halyards, which hung overboard and ran out at length, yet he held his hold, though he was sundry fathoms under the water, till he was hauled up by the same rope to the brim of the water, and then, with a boat hook and other means, got into the ship again and his life saved. So, let's picture this, right? Young man falls overboard. He's able to, like, hold on to the rope. He is many feet under the water, right, as he's dragged along, and he's able to be kind of hauled back in, and when he gets to the surface of the water, the people on the deck are able to kind of fish him out with this, like, big hook, right? It is the stuff that you would see in superhero movies today, okay? You can kind of picture this. But instead of crediting John Howland with having the strength to hold on or the other sailors with the fortitude to like actually haul him up. Remember, William Bradford began all that with it pleased God that he caught hold of the top sails and that his life was saved. And he goes on to say, he lived many years after and became a profitable member both in church and commonwealth. So what is he saying when he says, this man who was saved, right, by God's will, would later become a profitable member both in church and commonwealth. Profitable doesn't mean that he, like, made money. It means what? That he's profitable or important to the church. Yeah, and the community. So it's this idea that God saved him. Why? He had a plan. He had a plan. He had a plan. And y'all, that is what leads into what the Puritans believed, okay? So lots of strange terms here. Total depravity, doctrine of election, predestination, limited atonement, irresistible grace, yada, 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 right? Let me name a few and talk to y'all about it. So depravity. If I say that um, Anna Kate, right? If I say Anna Kate is a depraved soul, I wouldn't because she's not, but that's probably not a good thing. If I say someone's depraved, do you know what that means? Like yeah, like lower than human. There is something wrong. <laughs> depraved individual, right? So if you have total depravity, it's this idea that when Adam and Eve sinned, they were cast out of paradise, right? Well, after that, through their sin, all of their children and the generations that would follow would be born into sin. In fact, I think that's how, yeah, um, highlight that. It's this idea that because of the original sin, that's the sin in the Garden of Eden, right, by Adam and Eve, we are all born into sin. Now that is a pretty negative, you know, point of view, right? Is that what we feel today? I mean, do we think that children and babies are born sinners? No. I mean, now we, we you know, by and large think that everyone is born with a, you know, a clean slate that... You know, we're all born innocent. That is not the perspective of the Puritans, okay? Um, doctrine of election. Circle the word election and make a little note to the side. That means that only a few are elected for heaven. That God has only elected a few for heaven, okay? We're in the middle of the page, Brooke. Doctrine of elect. Got it? There you go. Okay. So, in other words, elected here is chosen, and it means that God only chose a few for the path to heaven. And it all ties up with this one, which is probably the most important one of all. So, circle it, star it, highlight it, you know, square it, do something. It needs to jump out. Predestination. Now, what is your destiny? Your goal in life. No, not necessarily your goal. It could be, I suppose. Your future purpose? Yeah, it's like your faith, right? Your destiny is 
um, you know, the path you're supposed to take, right? The idea of predestination, and y'all, this is pretty outrageous to our ears, okay, in our minds. But the Puritans believed that before you were even born, God knew whether you were on the track to heaven or hell. You were either predestined for heaven or for hell. And of course, the Puritans, as well as the pilgrims, felt that they were God's chosen people. So they, you know, felt, felt like they had taken risks, that they were the saints, right? Well, here's the problem. You may feel like you are doing everything God wants you to do, but you couldn't know for sure. Like, how would you know for sure that you're predestined for heaven? Especially with this idea, y'all, that, and this is irresistible grace, that your grace from God cannot be earned or denied. You are just born with it or not. Now, there's a problem with the logic to me. You know, if there's nothing that you can do to indicate that you are, or to like prove that you're on the way to heaven or the way to hell, you're either damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? I mean, why would you want to be good and strict and moral? It seems like that wouldn't be a whole lot of fun, right? I mean, remember the Puritans aren't even into like dancing and stuff. So you got to understand the mindset of these folks. They thought they were among the elect, they hoped they were among the elect, and they set out to live their lives to illustrate that they were worthy of being the elect. Now what happens, what happens is, you know, future generations occur, their children and then their grandchildren and great-grandchildren, they start to think, this is pretty restricting, you know? I, we don't know that we like this idea that only a few are saved by God, or by Christ, right? Limited atonement. Christ only died for a few, not all. I mean, that's pretty crazy for us now to think of, right? So what happens is these very strict beliefs start to kind of like fade away. In other words, they, I guess, broaden out to where we no longer, for the most part, believe in things like predestination. Why do you think we as human beings would not like the idea of predestination? I mean, why wouldn't you like the idea of predestination? You're born, elected to go to heaven or hell, and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. Makes life seem Yeah, I mean, it's, it totally takes away our free will, right? Our choice. So what happens is after several generations, these, a lot of these ideas kind of break down. But you want to understand the mindset. First of all, it kind of helps you go back now and look at the crucible and see folks like Rebecca Nurse, who lived a good life, but was the what? Um, target of jealousy from someone like Ann Putnam, whose children died. You know, her, all her baby side, you remember that? So she's looking for a reason why that would happen. And she doesn't want to think it's something she did to displease God. So maybe she needs to blame someone for it, okay? And then it's really going to be something to keep you um, uh, on track with the Scarlet Letter, which is the next book that we're going to be reading, okay? All right. Now, down at the bottom, um, Puritans wrote sermons, poems, religious tracts. Uh, diaries, histories, but what they didn't write, look at it. What did they not write very purposefully? <laughs> Fiction. Why not? <laughs> yeah, it, it was made up. Well, if you made it up, it's not a truth, and then there's always the question of where'd you get that idea? Right? Did the devil put that in your head? Like, what's going on there, right? So, um, inter you know, interesting stuff. Very different from, I think, the way people tend to believe today. Now, you need to jot this down, and I know I said it, but I don't think you had it written down anywhere. The pilgrims are generally more tolerant people than the Puritans. 
Okay, the pilgrims or separatists are generally more tolerant people than the Puritans. And because of this, you know, the Puritans have kind of gotten a bad rap. I mean, they wanted to be very moral and strict in the way they behaved. But I think what that tends to do is, you know, lead folks to live hypocritically. You know, it's hard to be perfect. <laughs> Nobody can be, right? Okay, now, let's talk about William Bradford. Tell me whether or not you think you can trust what he said. I know it's been a while since you've read it. Let me read an excerpt or two, and then we can, you know, kind of get our head back in this. He said, let's see. Talking about the way over, actually, let me skip ahead a little bit. All right, here we go. Being thus arrived in a good harbor. So this is after they arrived. Being thus arrived in a good harbor and brought safe to land, they fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean and delivered them from all the perils and miseries thereof, again, set their feet on the firm and stable earth, their proper element. Okay. Now he's talking about the starving time. They had a starving time too. But that which was most sad and lamentable was that in two or three months' time, half of their company died, especially in January and February, being the depth of winter and wanting houses and other comforts, being infected with scurvy and other diseases, which this long voyage and their incommodent or something like that condition had brought them. So as there died sometimes two or three a day in the foresaid time. Is there anything that indicates that this is not truthful? Let me ask you this. Did you find his account easier to read than John Smith's? There's a reason for that. He wrote in what was called the plain style, which was what the Puritans and the Pilgrims preferred to write in. Because if you wrote in an ornate style, you might be accused of having like the sin of vanity, right? Who does he attribute the good things that happened to? God. Who does John Smith attribute the good things that happened in his account? Himself. Mostly himself. Sometimes Pocahontas, but mostly himself. So y'all, did you trust his voice? Yeah. Did you put that you trusted his voice in that Google form that y'all did? Or you didn't do a Google form for this one, did you? Yes. So yeah, you figured that out. Okay, good. Um, at the bottom of the page, it says, do you trust this voice? Go ahead and write your answer in there. Hopefully you feel like you can. And then jot this little tidbit down, because I don't think I put it in here. Y'all, his history is considered to be the first accurate history written about a colony. Okay? You want to remember that. His account is considered the first accurate history about a colony. And y'all, that's important because to me, it's always been a bit of a, a slight on John Smith. You know, John Smith had already written a, actually two histories, but we don't know that we can fully trust the voice of John Smith. Okay. William Bradford, on the other hand, we feel like we can trust. Now y'all, he wrote this over the course of like 20 years, 21 actually. By the way, he was re-elected the governor of Plymouth 30 times. I mean, just that in itself tells you what about his character. People liked him. He was a good leader, right? A good man. In fact, I know you read in the biography, his wife actually fell overboard and, and, and drowned, like with land in sight, because the Mayflower would come over and you had everybody on board ship for a number of days while they were, of course, setting up their shelter, right? Well, in the course of the waiting, his wife falls overboard and drowns. But instead of, like, being bitter about that, I mean, he's sad, obviously, but instead of, like, railing against God, I mean, he's able to somehow, you know, stay faithful and true. And I, I think that that is to, to God. Okay, and I think that that tells us something about his character, too. By the way, any differences between the way he treats the Indians or they treat the Indians and then what you saw in Jamestown? Do you remember how this excerpt ended? 
I know it was Friday, that was almost a week ago. It talks about a contract between the Native Americans and the Pilgrims. And it essentially says that we are gonna be allies, that we will not harm you, you will not harm us. If an outside group attacks you or us, we'll uh, come to each other's aid. I mean, it's very equitable. Like it, it puts the Indians almost on like an equal footing with um, the Native Americans. And you definitely don't see that as much in like um, John Smith, right? Okay, now moving into Ann Bradstreet. Tell me, did y'all do the Ann Bradstreet yesterday? Like you were supposed to? Great, okay. Take a look at her bio real quick and just read through the bio and then, um, I know you've read it once before, but read it again and let's talk about her a little bit and then we'll see what our time, where our time is. Grayson, you just working that phone, girl. What you doing? Mm-hmm. Now, since you have that sheet in front of you, go ahead and highlight the things that you either found interesting yesterday or find interesting today, because she is quite a character. 